In recent years, the words diversity, equity, and inclusion have become political flashpoints. In 2023, legislators in 22 states introduced bills to restrict DEI efforts, including prohibiting state colleges from having DEI offices or staff and banning mandatory diversity training. Seven of those bills have become law. Against this contentious backdrop, the science and evidence on why diversity matters are often ignored. Today, we're going to talk about that research and the role that psychologists play in DEI work. So what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean? How has our understanding of racial and ethnic identity changed over the years? And how has the research informed diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts? What does the research say about why we should all care about diversity in our schools, workplaces, and other institutions? And what can psychological science add to discussions about diversity? Welcome to Speaking of Psychology, the flagship podcast of the American Psychological Association that examines the links between psychological science and everyday life. I'm Kim Mills. My guest today is Dr. Robert Sellers, the Charles D. Moody Collegiate Professor of Psychology and Education at the University of Michigan. He has been a professor at Michigan since 1997. From 2016 to 2021, he also served as the university's vice provost for equity and inclusion and chief diversity officer. Dr. Seller's research has focused on ethnic and racial identity and the role of race in the psychological lives of African-Americans. He has studied the significance and meaning that African-Americans place on race in defining themselves, the ways in which parents transmit messages about race to their children, and the ways in which black people cope with racial discrimination. Dr. Sellers has won numerous awards for his work, including the 2022 American Psychological Foundation Gold Medal Award for Impact in Psychology and the 2023 Association for Psychological Sciences James L. Jackson Lifetime Achievement Award for Transformative Scholarship. Dr. Sellers, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure, Kim. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Now, you gave a presentation at APA's convention in the summer of 2023 called Why Psychologists Should Care About Racial and Ethnic Diversity. Since many of the listeners to this podcast are not psychologists and didn't attend the convention, let's start with the really big question, why should all of us care about diversity? Why is it important that we prioritize diversity in our schools, workplaces, and other institutions? Well, Oftentimes, diversity is thought of in terms of how do we include uh, individuals and groups that have historically not been included in, uh, whether it's our sciences, in the workplace, in education, whatever uh, environment. And the notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion has always sort of focused on righting a wrong, uh, addressing the needs of those who traditionally not been included. And while that is absolutely important, and I strongly support those efforts and think those uh, uh, that uh, motivation is important, is also an even larger uh, argument and a larger um, issue that's at play, that by excluding those experiences of those groups, and uh, both through the science our theories, our um, applications, uh, we're not only damaging their uh, life chances, but we're also diminishing the science itself and damaging the applicability of treatments um, as well as drugs and other uh, things that we look for to enhance society's um, challenges. Uh, with regards to mental health and uh, other psychological uh, outcomes. The fact of the matter is that we as individuals bring to the table different experiences, different understandings, and that those different understandings are key to the growth of our ability to actually solve big and important problems. And so if we are limited in terms of those experiences and limited in terms of those insights, then our efforts to solve those big problems are in and of themselves limited. So we will not have everything at the table. 
And that's one of the things that we know in psychology is that diversity of perspective is really key to developing innovative ideas, to creating more effective ideas, and ultimately to solving big problems. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are often spoken of as as a unit. The three words are grouped together, but I'd like to break them down. Can you talk about what each word means and why it's important to work toward all three? So the best way for me to, to, to do that is to note that, so when I think of diversity, I'm thinking of trying to capture the totality of the experiences of whether you're talking about a student body, if in the case of higher education or education in general, or a team in terms of uh, in corporate America, the team working on the problem, the solution. Um, we're talking about uh, the totality of, of the human experience being captured. Too often, because of long-term historical societal uh, uh, injustices and inequities, certain uh, experiences are privileged and other experiences are not. Uh, so much to the point that we sometimes think that uh, there's a normative American experience or a normative human experience, uh, as opposed to recognize that there's a great deal of diversity uh, in those experiences. And so the, the first thing is trying to capture a more um, heterogeneous uh, uh, group of people, uh, group of experiences, and bringing them into play in terms of everything that we're doing, particularly as it relates to solving important problems. But having those different experiences and those different perspectives isn't enough if you still have those inequities. And so when I uh, 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 think of inequity, I think of the historical, uh, contemporary um, ways in which some people are allowed to participate and other people are not, or allowed to participate in certain ways and other people are not. And so breaking down those barriers are also extremely uh, important. So just having diversity, but still having those barriers doesn't uh, provide those uh, benefits. And then inclusion is really uh, the hardest part because that also uh, means that we are changing and dealing with issues of power, that everybody's perspective is somehow valued and included, uh, which means that's changing who determines uh, what counts and what doesn't count. So. Uh, an example that I often use is if I'm trying to solve a problem, what I'd rather have at the table uh, six people who look just like me, who have exactly the same experiences as I do, who know the same things that I do, who don't know the same things that I don't. Uh, no, in solving this problem, or would I rather have six people who uh, are around the table with me with very different perspectives, different strengths, different weaknesses that uh, we bring together to attack the problem? And in most cases, people would say, I'd rather have the former. I want uh, that uh, diversity of, of perspective. And that's great. But if you have that diversity of perspective, but yet, Three people in your group are not allowed to speak just by a function of, of who they are. Maybe it's the color of the shirt that they're wearing or the, uh, their gender or any number of things, but they're not allowed to participate just because of who they are. Uh, that's, that doesn't help you. And if two other people uh, may be allowed to participate, but just two minutes ago, uh, they were questioned outside of the room uh, about whether or not they belong based on their identity, they're not going to be able to contribute at the, the full amount. So we have to both address uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion all together, or else we don't get the benefits of uh, diversity right. in solving the big problems that we face as a community. 
Some DEI experts also argue for adding a B for belonging to the abbreviation DEI. Where do you stand on that concept? Do we need to add the B? I actually think belonging should be an important part of it. But it, it, from my perspective, belonging is also a byproduct of uh, uh, feeling like one is included, uh, that one has ownership in the enterprise in which they're bringing in. And if one has that sense, then uh, that inclusiveness also tends to lead to a sense of belonging. Let's switch gears for a minute and talk about your research. I mentioned in the introduction that you've spent your career studying racial identity in African-Americans. How has the way that psychologists think about racial and ethnic identity changed since you began working in the field? Well, first and foremost, uh, more work is actually being done. It's being looked at in a way that it historically had not been. Uh, so not only are, are folks looking at racial identity in African Americans and people of African descent, but now we're looking at racial identity and ethnic identity across a broad, uh, uh, group of, uh, communities and are focusing much more on the within group variability or how different African Americans uh, experience the world and experience race, as opposed to uh, when I first uh, started, much of the work was how are African Americans different from whites? And uh, such a binary focus uh, diminishes that uh, focus on the within group variation. So African Americans, just like uh, any other community, are rich and vibrant in the sense that they have uh, commonalities that almost all African Americans experience. They have things that some African Americans experience and others don't. And they have um, uh, attitudes, beliefs, uh, experiences that are unique to them as individuals. And one of the in most important parts of understanding African Americans and other groups that have traditionally not been uh, studied is understanding them in the context of their humanity. And the most important uh, part of understanding one's humanity is understanding one's individuality and that there is individual differences and seeing people uh, as being uh, different. One of the um, uh, fundamental findings that we found in social psychology over the years is that we tend to think about are within groups, the folks that we're most closest to, especially ourselves, in terms of individuals and the impact that as individuals, when we do things, um, uh, we see uh, the humanity there. And we tend to think of other groups as larger groups uh, and seeing their behaviors as being a function of who they are as a larger group. Uh, so we may say that, um, well, women do this because that's how women are uh, versus if it's somebody that we actually know, we may say, well, Jan does this because Jan was having a bad day uh, or uh, the, the situation around Jan is more the reason for, for why they, Jan may not be smiling, et cetera. Mm. And so it's that humanity that looking at within group variation uh, uh, provides that is so important that I think we've made uh, significant strides uh, uh, towards, but still have a ways to go. So it's interesting that there's, there's this need, this fundamental need we have to categorize and to put people in groups. But at the same time, it sounds like you have to resist some of that, not walking in with all these preconceived notions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those preconceived notions often fall into stereotypes um, that end up having real negative consequences of the life chances of uh, others, as well as limits our ability to connect with people who are different from us. If you are interested in more stories about mental health and well-being, consider On Our Minds from PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. <laughs> 
On Our Minds is a podcast about the teenage experience, made by teens for teens. Each season is hosted by two teens. This season, we're covering topics such as defining success, gender and masculinity, laws affecting teens, music and how it boosts our mood, and more. Student reporters from around the country produce stories. We talk to psychologists, musicians, and authors to get advice. There's a lot on our minds, and talking about it helps. On Our Minds Season 4 is produced by PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs in collaboration with KUOW's Radioactive Youth Media. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now, you're probably best known for developing something called the multimodal model of racial identity, which has been called transformative regarding how people think about racial identity. Can you explain what that model means? Well, so that model really attempts to understand the roles that race plays in African-Americans' psychological lives. That in this society, being of African descent, race is such an important um, uh, characteristic in the society that at some level, African-Americans have to, to define for themselves what it means in terms of who they are. And for some individuals, that definition is one that um, uh, is really focused on being race as a significant part of who they are. Whereas for others, it's only a small part of who they are. And for others still, it's not an important part of how one defines themselves. And so understanding that variation in the significance of race is one of the goals of the model. But along with understanding that variation and the significance that an individual plays on race, we also uh, differ in terms of what we actually think it means to be black, what it means to be a member of our group. We differ in the the extent to which we feel very positive about uh, uh, being a member of that group or less positive about being a member of of, of that uh, group. We also differ in terms of the extent to which we think others feel positive towards our group or less positive towards our group. Uh, And then a, a, a fourth component of this is the way in which we think about our ideologies around what it means to be black. So some of us may emphasize the commonalities amongst uh, all people and, again, uh, de-emphasize the uniqueness of being black. Others may emphasize uh, the the commonalities amongst all uh, black folks when they think about uh, uh, being black, uh, which we would call a nationalist ideology. First, we would call more of a humanist ideology. Some of us focus uh, more in terms of um, the uh, larger American experience uh, in the African-American term and see themselves as being strongly connected to uh, traditional mainstream American uh, ideas, cultural values, et cetera, uh, whereas still others will focus on uh, issues of oppression and see commonalities with other oppressed groups. They may differ in terms of who those groups are, but they see a commonality. So if you break down all, uh, break down just the notion of what it means to be black in African Americans, you can see a significant variation in, in terms of, uh, uh, how they psychologically experience one's blackness. And what we found is that that psychological experience of one's blackness has implications for a number of different uh, outcomes uh, when coupled with the different types of racial contexts in which they uh, exist. I, I mentioned in the introduction that DEI efforts have become a political flashpoint in recent years, and many programs have faced pushback and criticism and even legislative bans particularly at the state level. As someone who's spent your life doing this work, do you feel frustrated by this? And do you think these efforts are still moving even haltingly in a positive direction? I feel incredibly frustrated in in part because the nature of the conversation is often, uh, and the nature of the critique is often at such a surface level and such an uninformed level. 
So one of the things that uh, uh, I teach my students is that when you begin to have a debate around a, a set of issues, it's important that you actually define the underlying concepts that uh, uh, you're attempting to get at. Unfortunately, what's happened is DEI has been defined in ways that have nothing to do with most of the DEI efforts uh, that are uh, at play at, on our campuses, in our um, organizations, our um, uh, corporations. Uh, they have little to do with the actual um uh, practices, policies, procedures uh, that uh, are going on under the uh, idea of DEI. But yet the concept is used as a wedge uh, to create identity threat uh, uh, such that, again, either resources are given are being uh, taken away uh, from one group and given to another small minority group, or there's efforts to try to brainwash people to think in a particular ideology or a particular, usually political ideology uh, that is, a, again, seen as a threat uh, to individuals. Uh, and people have utilized this, quite frankly, for their own personal, uh, political, and professional um, motives and opportunities to get ahead, uh, when in fact, when, when you think about what DEI is ultimately about, um, most of us would not be outraged by uh, the work that, that, that's happening. But one of the criticisms that I often hear about DEI efforts, particularly in business, is that there is not a lot of empirical research demonstrating the value. How do you respond to that assertion? What do you say to the critics who demand, show me the numbers? Well, so first of all, there I would actually argue there is a great deal of uh, evidence. So there's a great deal of evidence, as I'd mentioned, that um, diverse perspectives lead to more creative problem solving, to more ideas, and ultimately more effective ideas. Uh, and just about every business, uh, and I would uh, argue educational case, uh, ultimately comes down to uh, an issue of problem solving. And given that diversity is so important to innovation, is so important to uh, creativity, is so important to uh, problem solving, having a diversity of ideas, a diversity of perspectives um, uh, is key to just about every industry's mission or goal. And I would argue is key to just about every field in education's mission and goal. I would argue that the sciences are fundamentally about problem solving. The social sciences are fundamentally about problem solving. Most of the professions are fundamentally about um, um, problem solving. And so having that diversity of perspective is incredibly important in that uh, particular space. Now, People will then say, yeah, I'm all for diversity of thought. That's absolutely. In fact, I worry that DEI keeps us from having diversity of thought. Well, the reality is that diversity of thought really comes from a diversity of lived experiences. Uh, that diversity of thought leads to different questions, but those different questions come from individuals, different lived experiences and understanding with regards to how the world works, which we often think of in terms of um, schemas. I would argue, though, uh, those different experiences about how the world works are deeply influenced by our various social identities, which, again, we have plenty of data to demonstrate. So as a large African-American male who played football, my experience in the world is very different than someone who is Kim, very <laughs> different from Kim's yeah. experiences. <laughs> and there are things that you would see that I would not see. There are questions that you would ask that I would not ask. 
Um, uh, and not having that perspective, not having your perspective in the room damages not only myself, but I mean, not only you, but also damages myself and our larger ability to do good work. So there, and, and we have, uh, the, um, work of, uh, Kathy Phillips, the work of Scott Page. So many others have demonstrated the value of diversity with regards to uh, uh, problem solving. Where it becomes a challenge is we often define DEI work as a class or training and that we assume that that DEI training for one day is going to change long-term historic societal problems that have happened for generations, and we don't find that actually working. Duh. Do we <laughs> expect anything different? Right. So DEI is not something that's in a can. It is not something that is um, uh, delivered in a single shot. It must fundamentally impact the way in which we as structures, communities, and organizations actually operate. It must change those processes. It must change those procedures, must change um, those policies, and change those cultures in such a way that it provides opportunity for a wide variety of experiences and for individuals who are there to feel as if they are both included and that they are not um, in spaces where they're uh, experiencing discrimination and other uh, uh, forms of attack as a function of uh, that difference. I want to turn for a moment to the Supreme Court decision in the case of Students for Fair Admissions versus uh, President and Fellows of Harvard College, which found that colleges and universities cannot use race as a factor in admissions. What do you think the impact of that decision will be not only on colleges and universities, but down the road in our society generally? On a personal level, I was uh, deeply disappointed, though I wish I could say surprised. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, race in particular, along with a number of other uh, social identities, but race in particular from the founding of this country uh, up until very, 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 very recently has fundamentally been a determinant of individuals' life chances. Just simply by being born in a particular racial category, your probability of success, whether it's educational success, whether it's occupational success, whether it's experiencing violence, whether it's experiencing any number of disease, whether it's uh, how long one actually lives, has been fundamentally tied to race. And in and and many, 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 many of those instances can also be demonstratively tied to policies that this country has put in place to um, um, uh, unlevel, quote unquote, the playing field. And the assumption that by simply saying we are no longer going to look at race as a way to uh, address some of those inequities. And for that matter, not just race, but also gender and national origin were also part of the uh, 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 decision, um, is extremely naive and can only um, uh, make sense from a space of privilege. Uh, so it's like you're running a race and in that race, for the first uh, uh, three quarters of a mile, you put chains on uh, half of the participants and you have them run the race. And then you get to uh, 100 feet from the uh, finish line and you see these disparities there and then say, OK, we're not going to put any more chains on people and say, finish the race. You, it, it seems to me to be really misguided, um, uh, not particularly uh, well thought out in, in all of those reasons. So mm -hmm. that's my uh, personal experience. Now, with that said, 
uh, I would argue for uh, my colleagues and, and, and having been a chief diversity officer uh, at an institution in a state that had uh, basically already had those same challenges uh, that the Supreme Court put nationally in uh, Michigan, uh, previously the uh, in uh, uh, 2004, the uh, state passed a constitutional amendment that uh, banned the use of right. uh, race, gender, and national origin in admissions. Uh, and so we have to work very, very hard to find legally permissible ways to address uh, racial, gender, national origin uh, disparities uh, that we all know still exist. Uh, and it's going to be incumbent upon uh, those who uh, care about diversity, equity, and inclusion and having a just society to work to, uh, again, work within the, the law uh, uh, to find effective uh, ways to address uh, these uh, inequalities and also to work to find ways to ultimately, hopefully, change um, the law. That's playing the long game. Yeah. On what might be a more positive note, and we can talk about it, uh, is a change I'm, we're seeing in the culture around recognizing the sins of the past, whether that's changing the names of schools and streets to remove the names of enslavers or changing the names of pro sports teams in response to complaints from indigenous people, for example. And in the case of APA, we issued a formal apology for policies and practices that denigrated or just ignored people of color over time in, in the practice and, and discipline of psychology. How important are these moves? Are they mostly performative or are they truly a step toward infusing DEI into our culture? That's a very good question. Um, first, I would say they're absolutely performative and performative is important. So um, uh, I, I believe that's an important step. Uh, symbols matter. Uh, they're a fundamental part of our culture. Uh, and so addressing uh, those performative uh, aspects are important, but they cannot be uh, seen as sufficient in any way. So I see them as necessary, but not sufficient. They have to be a, a, a one part of the level of change that has to occur. Uh, part of that change has to always be structural. Part of that change also has to be about uh, redistributing opportunities, redistributing power, redistributing wealth. Uh, if one is actually uh, look, redistributing access and opportunity, these are all part of the, the change. But if, if we stop at the performative and say, ah, we did it, uh, then we, we have we are dooming ourselves to uh, continued inequality. And that continued inequality not only dooms uh, those of us who are on the um, uh, tough end of that, um, but it also dooms the larger society in terms of being able to actually address the major problems that we uh, face. So I often think, for instance, the uh, uh, cure of cancer, cure to cancer, may be sitting in a perspective that a kid in a low performing school um, in uh, an inner city uh, space who has a way of asking a very different question just based on what that kid sees every day uh, 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 walking to school that forces them to ask a question that's just slightly different from the way in which you've always done it in the past uh, that could actually be the cure. But because that kid is in a uh, stuck in a low performing school and that uh, will not have an opportunity to connect with our highest performing and our highest resource uh, 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 colleges and universities, uh, they will never have an opportunity to solve that particular problem or the problem of global warming. 
or the problem of peace in the world. All of these things that we face as a larger human society is dependent on us having our entire human uh, equity, our human uh, capital in play. And when we uh, allow parts of our society to be systematically excluded from um, uh, our resources and our opportunities to solve problems, again, not only do they suffer, but we as a larger community also suffer. Last question. I want to circle back to the talk that you gave at the APA convention on, on why diversity matters for psychological science. Why is diversity an especially important issue in psychology and what could and should psychology be doing to address and increase diversity in psychological research? Uh, well, first of all, it, it is actually relatively simple. So psychology has historically been about uh, studying human behavior and but studying human behavior from an extremely narrow perspective. So studying it primarily in Western, uh, educated, industrial, rich, democratic societies, or has been captured weird societies. Right. And even within those very weird societies, the small, small, small slice of the human experience, um, uh, we tend to uh, you could say uh, predominantly white, predominantly male, predominantly heterosexual, predominantly able uh, bodied um, um, spaces and experiences. And as a result, we have a very, very small picture of what normative human behavior actually looks like. And, and until we begin to both study the vast majority of the human experience, include in the folks who are actually doing the study, the vast majority of the human experience, because if you don't, you will risk um, uh, misinterpreting, misunderstanding what you're actually seeing and um, uh, doing great harm, which psychology has historically done in, in many cases. Um, and we have to be willing to accept those new ideas and those new uh, perspectives as enriching our understanding of normative um, human behavior and not just say, ah, well, he studies African Americans and that's really nice. That's quaint. But what does that have to do with human behavior? Uh, which I have been asked on, uh, on numerous occasions wow. throughout my career. Uh, and, and yet we have to change, um, uh, that, uh, particular perspective. Does that mean a lot of the science is, is downright wrong or it's just skewed? I would say a lot of the science, uh, we don't know how much it's skewed because, uh, again, it's important to always remember that when I study uh, African-Americans in my work, I'm studying humans, too. So there are certain things about African-Americans that are universal to all humans, most likely. And there are certain things that are about African-Americans experiences that are probably unique to African-Americans. And there are certain things that overlap across some African-Americans and some non-African-Americans. So we don't really know how uh, limited our uh, psychology actually is, which is even more scary um, uh, because we don't know. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's especially important for psychology as a science, um, as a practice uh, to be as diverse, equitable, and inclusive because we're fundamentally talking about the human experience. Well, Dr. Sellers, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's been very interesting talking to you. I appreciate your time. Uh, Kim, it has been absolutely my pleasure. I've really enjoyed our conversation. You can find previous episodes of Speaking of Psychology on our website at www.speakingofpsychology.org, 
or on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you've heard, please leave us a review. If you have comments or ideas for future podcasts, you can email us at speakingofpsychology at apa.org. Speaking of Psychology is produced by Lee Weinerman. Our sound editor is Chris Kondayan. Thank you for listening. For the American Psychological Association, I'm Kim Mills. <laughs>